really like to welcome you to our webinar relative to the T-Scan 3 system. Um, I, I must say that this, I was skeptical many years ago. I looked at the T-Scan several years ago and I was very skeptical in its value. But I have uh, enjoyed the enhancements that have been made and this has been revolutionary truly in my practice especially when it comes to final and precise occlusal adjustments in several areas, um, in, in especially in tonight's topic with implant management. As you see on your screen, the, the T-Scan 3 system is made up of a handle that is plugged into the computer through USB cabling, and then a sensor that has some 1,300 sense cells plugged that is plugged into the handle. The, uh, the handle is operable remotely, as you can see the buttons here for taking a new recording or activating the recording itself. It's a tremendous value to be able to do this uh, remotely and not have to work on the laptop itself. The idea behind the system is certainly that um, many individuals report to us that they feel a high spot. This is not an implant case, but it is a full mouth restoration case that we did that the patient described a feeling of premature contact on the upper left side. Now what's interesting is that of course all these are bonded uh, units and we have what five or seven contacts on the terminal tooth here, two contacts on the second uh, molar, a contact on the second bicuspid, two contacts on the first bicuspid, and something on the cuspid. Of course, when the patient says to us that that, uh, that side is high, we really don't know which of those contacts occurred first, um, which is truly premature. Uh, there is no contact paper that uh, is available that tells us which contact occurred first, only in fact that the contact occurred. And in implant management, not only are we concerned with which contact occurred first, but which contact occurred with the highest force. What I would like to do is hold this example till the end and demonstrate to you which contact occurred first, but for right now, let's move into the implant world. So a patient appears to me on their regular three-month peri-implant recall in 1996. This individual, as you can see, has two implants placed. This is an implant in the number 29 area, and this is an implant in the number 30 area with a bicuspidized restorative environment. At the time that we placed these in the late 80s, 80s, the implants were splinted together. We managed this patient through her recall visits every three months. And in 1998, I started to notice, as you can see here, some dishing of the crestal bone. And in fact, we have two threads that have become pretty well exposed. At that point, I wasn't convinced that I should do anything about it, but following uh, routine maintenance, we found that she continued to lose bone to the point of April of 03, where now we are seeing the dished out bone to include four threads. I realize now that this is progressive, that the, that the view from the previous film is, uh, is not going to be stable, that we are in fact losing active bone. And in my world, I try to make things simple. I, I think about two things that can cause that bone loss. One is bugs and the other is the bike. Because she was very faithful in her home care and very faithful in her maintenance professionally, I wondered if the occlusion was the primary cause of this situation. So what we did is we opted for 
an evaluation and potential care utilizing the T-scan. So if we go to a clinical view, when I had her bite together on articulating paper, this is the view that we saw. And what you see here is a natural lateral incisor, a natural lower cuspid on the right side that has a crown on it, a natural first bicuspid that has a crown on it, then the second bicuspid that's implanted and splinted to the first molar that's implanted. Now, to my surprise, with the dishing out being on this first molar, there was no articulator paper contact on that. Rather, I saw it here and, of course, here. So I ask you, what would you grind on in that case? I'm, I wasn't really sure. I wasn't sure if those were artifact smudges. I wasn't sure if this contact occurred before this contact or vice versa. But utilizing the T-scan, I could see that, in fact, the anterior abutment was one of the premature contacts with higher force. Now, this is a representation of the maxillary arch. Note that the terminal implant is opposing number three, so we do have some contact there. The anterior implant is opposing number four. The idea in implant application is we want to delay the contact force on an implant, allowing the contact force to occur on a natural tooth. So that natural tooth has time to depress into the socket in advance of the contact on the implant. In other words, we want to have a non-simultaneous occlusal scheme. So that means that I should have contact on the teeth anterior to the implant prior to contact on the implant. And if I continue to record this and play this three one-hundredths of a second later, you can see that my primary force is on the anterior abutment. That is reverse of what I intend. So I move forward, I adjust that anterior abutment, and now this is the occlusal scheme that I get. I can see contact on the cuspid, some contact on the first bicuspid, and then, of course, more contact than I even had previously on the implant. And if I play the T-scan, I see that we, we have contact still on the, an, on the anterior implant abutment, we start to develop contact on the natural tooth. As I play just a little forward, two 100 seconds of a later, we are, we are getting contact on the anterior abutment, but we still have tremendous contact. I'm sorry, we have contact on the an, uh, anterior to the abutments, but we have contact significant contact on the abutments themselves. And if I play it further again, we see significant contact on those implants. So I decided to make adjustments to these contacts again. 